critical care caught in the crosshairs. Closures and consolidations of places where every second could mean the difference between life and death. This is the reality right here in southern Ontario. A system struggling amid a shortage of staff and the extreme decisions now being made. Good evening. Imagine the situation. You or a loved one need crucial treatment and you're told it isn't available at your nearest hospital. That's not just a fear. It's a fact for some families in our region. Intensive care units unable to operate. CTV Siobhan Morris is live in Bowmanville with more. Siobhan. Well, Nathan, the ICU here in Bowmanville is just not open. We don't know how long that's going to be the case. Lake Ridge Health has said that they've had to make the difficult decision to consolidate intensive care at other hospitals. Hospital, hospitals a highway trip away in Oshawa and in Ajax, really frustrating the Ontario Nurses Association. They say the closure of the ICU here is a sign of just how bad this staffing crisis right across the province has become. They talk about this ICU in Bowmanville in particular as being really critical. This is a growing community along the 401. So you've got many other communities who'd be counting on the 12 beds here to get that critical care. And they say they can't afford the people who live along that 401 corridor, corridor uh, to lose these beds. We also know that going into the long weekend, when we typically see uh, check-ins at Ontario hospitals spike, there are at least 14 hospitals that have had to uh, either close some units or uh, uh, close some beds or reallocate care, move care around, do things differently than they typically do because they just don't have the staff to do it. The Ontario Nurses Association expects this sort of thing to continue well into the future because they just don't have enough people. We know that nurses have been feeling underappreciated, and uh, so this is going to be a, con a continuing issue. Reporting live, I'm Siobhan Morris. Back to you. Thank you, Siobhan. Well, if you are the parent of a young child, there's a chance you've spent part of the day trying to find a booking for them to receive a COVID-19 vaccine. Some of our province's youngest now eligible to join the line. They have finally arrived. Vaccines for children distributed across the province. And as of this morning, parents and caregivers can book appointments for their children from six months to five years of age. There's basically four places you can get it. You can contact your primary care provider as as many family doctors, nurse practitioners, even pediatricians are giving these in their offices. You can contact your local public health unit. They will be having clinics available. And you can contact your local pharmacy as well. Health Canada approved the use of pediatric Moderna Spikevax mRNA COVID-19 vaccine earlier this month. As Ontario's health minister puts it, the vaccine is safe and effective. Dr. Isaac Bogosh says while clinical trials are always limited, once a vaccine is administered to a much larger population, we can expect to see some rare side effects, just as we have for every other drug or vaccine that's rolled out. But caregivers will have to balance that against the benefits of vaccines, a decision he says parents should be allowed to make without stigma. I remember when NACI came out, uh, National Advisory Committee on Immunizations came out with the vaccine recommendations for the uh, cohort just a bit older than this. And when they first came out with this, the language was wonderful. They said, you know what? We respect everyone's concerns. We respect that people want to vaccinate their kids. We respect that some people might have some additional concerns. No stigma. L like, let's, let's not stigmatize parents for the decisions. Let's give everyone a chance to ask the questions that they need to ask and to be comfortable with this before they choose to vaccinate their children. If you do choose to vaccinate your child, the National Advisory Committee on Immunizations recommends an eight-week window between first and second doses. Immunocompromised young people between the ages of 12 and 17 are also eligible to get booster shots today, as long as six months have passed since their first booster dose. And if you have questions surrounding the booking process, our online team has some of the answers for you. That's at ctvnewstoronto.ca. Straight ahead, the grim investigation on a Scarborough street. Homicide detectives focusing in on a home following the death of a woman. The late breaking details of the person now charged. You could call it a Rogers revamp or maybe the outfield facelift. The home of the Blue Jays getting its first hefty renovation in decades. Some TLC for MLB. If you've spent any time at the Dome lately, you know it could use a little work. And tonight, we know what that's going to look like. CTV's Austin Delaney is live downtown with more Austin. Over three decades, there's been a few tweaks here and there, but no major reno at the at, at Rogers Center. That's about to change. The owners say it's time. They're going to sink $300 million into it to make it look more like a ballpark. Come opening day next April, the Jays are promising a better ballpark. 
what fans see and what they look at will be dramatically different. When the old Sky Dome opened some 33 years ago in a fierce rainstorm, its retractable roof was a marvel. And that night, no one cared they got wet because it worked. It was built as a multi-purpose stadium, not just a ballpark. We are missing out on a lot of what makes being a fan in a modern environment so great and going to a ball game so great. Jay's president and CEO, Mark Shapiro, wants to remodel Rogers Center into a modern-day ballpark by bringing the fans closer to the game and making it an entertainment destination. In the first phase this offseason, the creation of multiple new social spaces with patios, drink rails, bars, and viewing platforms. Raised bullpens surrounded by traditional and new bleacher seats, as well as social viewing areas that look into the bullpens to increase fan and player interaction. 100 level seats brought forward to the new outfield walls to bring the fans closer to the game. Some of those things are the way fans that might not just want to watch the game and might want to be at the game but not necessarily watch every pitch of the game, experience it. The original 33-year-old 500 seats will be replaced with slightly bigger and more comfortable seats. And the 500 seats nearest the screen will be removed entirely, replaced by two bars. The best rooftop experience, you know, in Toronto when the roof's open in the middle of summer, you know, with the game going on in the background. The next phase, demolishing the 100-level bowl, creating a new level with premium seats, clubs, and better vantage points. Jay's play-by-play -play announcer, Buck Martinez, says... It is time. When you think about it, it is certainly outdated. I mean, the, so many ballparks are, are ter terrific ballparks. You know, they're baseball-centric. And I think that's what Mark and the Blue Jays want to accomplish is to create an experience where people can say, wow, Toronto's got a baseball park now. And I think it's uh, great news, and I look forward to it. Shapiro hopes that by elevating the bullpens, fans can get in the faces of the opposition pitchers warming up. And we're looking at live pictures from our chopper over Rogers Centre right now as fans arrive for tonight's game. Uh, the management says this reno should last between 10 and 12 years. After that, they're going to have to make some decisions on where the Blue Jays will play. As for the Astro turf leaving, no, it's not going to happen anymore. That's staying right now. We're going live. I'm Austin Delaney. Thank you, Austin. Well, from one big venue to another, a disturbing incident at Scotiabank Arena. Fireworks were set off at the end of a concert last night. Video shared by audience members show what appear to be fireworks going off at one end of the arena. Police say three people suffered minor injuries and were treated at the scene. At first, everyone was surprised and was not really understanding that, right? So we thought it was part of the concert. But suddenly, like, uh, it went, like, in all directions and then we saw like some people in the ground level like running and uh, trying to protect themselves so it was like crazy police are now reviewing security video they say those responsible could face charges of mischief and endangering life it's still not clear how someone may have been able to get fireworks into the concert they believe sports and entertainment has not commented all right, let's take a look outside now. It's shaping up to be an exciting weekend in the city, and people are already looking to the forecast. Michelle Jobins here we're at Lamport Stadium tonight. Michelle, we're counting down to the Caribbean Carnival. That's right, and it is a great weekend for it. We have sunshine and warmth, a little bit windy right now here at Lamport Stadium. The King and Queen showcases tonight. Things are getting underway soon, and we're going to show you what's happening in just a bit. But let's take a look at the forecast right now. Of course, breezy at times. We do have a risk of showers this evening. Most of that staying down Hamilton, Niagara, or up towards Peterborough over Lindsay area. Temperatures still in the upper 20s throughout the region right now. We are sitting here in the Toronto area at 28 at the islands feeling like 32 with sunshine more cloud at Pearson 27 feeling like 30 some fog patches overnight tonight and a low of 15 degrees I'll be back with your full forecast back to you all right thank you Michelle coming up the remarkable story of a woman who spent nearly a year on a ventilator now back home with her family the work from loved ones and health professionals to help her reach this pivotal point Next to a murder investigation in a Scarborough neighborhood. A man charged in the death of his sister. CTV's Janice Golding is live near Victoria Park in Donside with more. Janice. 
Hi, Nathan. Yes, police say they were called about an assault in this home behind us at around 5.30 this morning. And when they arrived here, they found a woman in life-threatening condition. A woman they allege had been attacked by her own brother. A single police cruiser guards the scene. The risk to public safety deemed minimal. There are no outstanding suspects. A 37-year-old man already in custody arrested around 5.30 this morning after allegedly assaulting his sister, 49-year-old Evdokia Djeputsis, who would die in hospital. Just, oh my God, you know. Wow. Neighbors on Westbourne Avenue near Victoria Park and Donside Drive say Giaputz's death is a tragedy. They also recount repeat police involvement at the home over the years. It was always something weird. They had different arguments, different times. Sometimes we can't sleep because of the arguments. It's very loud. There was a few incidents where, um, you know, police were brought to the house due to some disruptions at the house. So it's not a first account seeing this happen. Neighbors say the accused in this case is familiar among those living in the area. This guy sometimes, this uh, boy, slowly walk and run, slowly walk and run. I four years I've seen this boy. Just roll around the streets, just stand there for a few seconds and just, just stand there and do nothing. Or middle of the street, yeah. And while they say the man grew up in the home, he was not well known. My daughter went to school with him, with the person that's charged with it. Quiet. <laughs> Um, he was sort of into him. It just, uh, how would you put it, um, someone who withdrawn? He didn't talk to nobody. He just in and out of the house, get his Tim Hortons, and then he'd go home, and that's about it. But I saw a few times he's injured, in hand injuries. Sometimes it's hanging in his neck, his bandage. I don't know what happened, but never ask because he's not a very friendly guy. He's always stare. And Chris Giaputsis has been charged with second-degree murder. Chris Giaputsis had a brief court appearance via video link this afternoon. Evdokia Giaputsis is Toronto's 40th homicide victim of the year. Reporting live from Janice Golding, now back to Zoraida. Thank you, Janice. Police say they have broken up three criminal networks in the GTA, recovering over $12 million worth of stolen vehicles. More than 200 have been recovered, nearly 40% of them Acuras or Honda. Most of the thefts occurred in Ontario, where the OPP says vehicle identification numbers were altered before the cars were registered and resold. An undisclosed number of Service Ontario employees are accused of helping in the registration process. They are among 28 people charged, most from the GTA. We want to take this opportunity to remind everyone to be extremely cautious when purchasing a used vehicle. If any part of the transaction or anything leading up to the transaction seems suspicious, do not provide funds and contact law enforcement. Police allege the suspects used some of the recovered vehicles to commit other crimes. Officers also seized six firearms along with quantities of drugs and $160,000 in cash. Nearly two, the nearly two-year investigation was a joint effort also involving police services in Durham, York, Peel and Saskatoon. Provincial police are hoping to give thrill seekers a different way to test their limits without putting others at risk on public roads. The OPP set up a demonstration of slalom racing outside Vaughan Mills Shopping Centre this morning. Police have been cracking down on illegal street racing and have partnered with local driving clubs and track owners to show drivers there are ways to race in a controlled and much safer setting. We don't want you out on an uh, industrial road, a private parking lot, uh, some rural area where you're just uh, you know, at, at the whim of uh, what's in front of you. It's completely completely uncontrolled and you don't know what kind of risks could could be coming up in front of you and in something like this sure there's going to be risk associated with it but it's a far safer environment the OPP are working with police services in the GTA to tackle dangerous driving as part of project buccaneer they're also encouraging Ontarians to think about road safety before the holiday long weekend we are learning more about a deadly skydiving incident that claimed the life of an off-duty Ottawa firefighter. It happened yesterday afternoon at Armprior Airport. One person was pronounced dead at the scene. CTV News has learned the victim was Jeff Dean, a 45-year-old member of an Ottawa fire station and a father of two. Parachute Ottawa said today that Dean's parachute deployed properly during his jump, claiming he died after carrying out an advanced parachute maneuver. The OPP are investigating and the Ministry of Labour has been notified of the incident. 
Halton police are looking for answers after what they're calling a case of severe vandalism against an Oakville home. It was reported last Friday when residents returned to their home near Third Line and Hickson Street. Police say someone had climbed onto the roof and left a garden hose running into a vent for 18 to 20 hours. The value of the damage was estimated at more than $100,000. Investigators say a suspect or suspects also slashed an inflatable hot tub and cut a phone line to the house. And Halton police are hoping to speak with anyone who was in the area of Third Line and Hickson Street July 21st and 22nd or anyone with video from the neighborhood on those dates. Legislators are gearing up for an early return to Queen's Park after the June election. The Ford government has confirmed the provincial throne speech will be delivered by Lieutenant Governor Elizabeth Dowdswell on August 9th. The Premier confirmed last month that the legislature will sit for a rare summer session starting the day before. The progressive conservatives are expected to focus on passing their budget. It was first introduced before the election and the strengthening of their majority government. And straight ahead, it's being called a scary and frightening glimpse into the future. How the recent Rogers outage could foreshadow an even more damaging situation. Imagine being in a self-driving car and the network drops. In Quebec, Pope Francis spoke about the church feeling the burden of failure over residential schools. He held mass at the oldest Catholic pilgrimage site in North America as many survivors call for meaningful action. CTV's Vanessa Lee reports. Pope Francis arrived to cheers at the Basilica of Saint Anne de Beaupré, one of the oldest and most popular pilgrimage sites in North America. He drove by and he waved at me and I felt just like I was just blessed and touched by him that he's to be here in Canada. I just feel so honored. The Pope presiding over Mass with the congregation made up largely of residential school survivors. Thousands more watched on large screens outside as he addressed the church's difficult and demanding journey of healing and reconciliation. In confronting the scandal of evil and the body of Christ wounded in the flesh of our indigenous brothers and sisters, we too have experienced deep dismay. We too feel the burden of failure. For many experiencing the wounds of that failure, healing will take more than words. Moments before the service began, a silent protest urging the Pope to take action, to rescind the doctrine of discovery, a centuries-old policy that was used to justify the colonization of Indigenous lands. The Indigenous peoples will be meeting after these events. We will be looking to see, uh, you know, what our, our next steps are. How are we going to plan to also engage and have those discussions with the CCCB and to continue working on this message. The Mass was also broadcast on the Plains of Abraham, taken in by a smaller than anticipated group, but with big hopes for change. To everyone, the First Nation, everyone can be one church like to we can move together in our community pope francis led evening prayers at notre dame de quebec cathedral basilica one of his last events in quebec before making his way to wicalowit tomorrow afternoon vanessa lee ctv news quebec city it appears the monkeypox virus has been detected in another canadian province newfoundland and labrador is reporting its first probable case but officials are not providing details out of concern about stigmatizing certain groups. 745 cases of monkeypox have been confirmed in Canada. As of Monday, there were 326 cases in Ontario, 250 of them in Toronto. It is being described as devastating. Torrential rains have unleashed heavy flooding in central Appalachia. There have been at least eight deaths in Kentucky and a number of people are unaccounted for. Rescue crews are searching for anyone who is stranded amid the fast rising water. A state of emergency has been declared in several counties and the National Guard has been deployed to the hardest hit areas. Flash flooding and mudslides were also reported in western Virginia and southern west Virginia. One of the world's most iconic churches is on track to reopen in 2024. The first phase to secure the structure of Notre Dame Cathedral is complete. Now the focus shifts to rebuilding its wooden framework and restoring the vaults. That will begin at the end of the summer. The work began the day after the devastating fire in 2019 that tore through its roof and knocked down the church's spire. 
NASA is looking to add some new space rocks to its collection. The agency plans to bring back samples from Mars. But it's going to take a while. A return orbiter is scheduled to launch in 2027, followed by a sample retrieval lander the next year. Now, it is going to take years for spacecraft to get back from the red planet, so the samples are expected on Earth in 2033. Meanwhile, an out-of-this-world price was paid for an ancient dinosaur skeleton. An anonymous buyer shelled out just over $6 million for this Gorgosaurus. Sotheby's in New York says it's the first specimen of its kind to come to auction. And there are only about 20 known examples, the majority being found in Canada. This one was discovered in Montana in 2018. The Gorgosaurus is a distant cousin of the more famous Tyrannosaurus rex. The recent Rogers outage affected millions of people across the country. Now, there is concern about potential consequences of a telecommunications shutdown in the future. We get the details from BNM Bloomberg's Paige Ellis. Picture the scene. You're riding down a highway in a self-driving vehicle when suddenly the cell network drops. Your car can no longer communicate with the world around it. What happens next? It's a potentially dangerous situation and hardly far-fetched. As autonomous technology evolves, our cars will become increasingly dependent on cellular data. What happened uh, with the Rogers outage was the extreme end of the scenario planning that we do. Industry expert Flavio Volpe says the day may come when self-driving cars have no steering wheels. And if the network fails, those vehicles will likely just pull over, grinding traffic to a halt. But not all cars are created equal. What about people in emergency scenarios? What about emergency vehicles? What about em emergency responders? What about school buses? Volpe says engineers are still trying to determine whether the self-driving vehicles of the future will rely on one network, like our cell phones do, or multiple. For surgeons who research robotic and remote surgery, like those here at St. Michael's Hospital in downtown Toronto, the ability to ping-pong off of different networks could mean the difference between life and death. We really need a stable uh, access to the internet and the secure network uh, to be able to provide health care. Remote surgery, where a doctor is in one city and the patient is in another, is still nascent. But a stable network is a prerequisite. Because even though nurses and anesthesiologists will be waiting in the wings... The surgeon isn't there to rescue this. So really it's a situation that's quite uh, scary and frightening and situations that no medical professional or no patient wants to be in. And BNM Bloomberg's Paige Ellis joins us now. Paige, you've done a lot of work gathering new information. What got you started? You know, it was actually a really fascinating note by an analyst at National Bank Financial. They described uh, the, the silver lining, as they put it, of the Rogers outage as being the fact that we're still relatively early in the technological evolution of autonomous driving and remote surgery. Now, those applications, of course, exist, uh, but we don't have highways that are, you know, uh, chock-a-block with self-driving vehicles. We don't have situations where, you know, open heart surgery is being performed by a surgeon in another city. So that, that kind of got me interested in the subject and I decided to pursue it. Now, is this a wake-up call for other sectors? Hmm. You know, I think a lot of uh, sectors that rely on, on uh, cellular data or a reliable network will certainly perk up. Uh, these two uh, situations are really critical because they're very advanced applications and they could be life or death. As I mentioned in my report, uh, what the sector believes will happen in the auto industry is a self-driving vehicle would just pull itself over. But imagine that you were on uh, in the operating room undergoing a very complicated surgery. Uh, minutes count, as the, as the doctor put it to me uh, in that interview. And so I think everybody in every realm is considering the implications of a network outage and how the sorts of contingency plans they should be building in. Yeah, lots to consider. BNM Bloomberg's Paige Ellis, thank you. Thank you. Coming up, competition on a keyboard. New studies show the pressures of being a high-level athlete also extend to eSport players. The injuries and the stressors for gamers in combat on a computer.
And I'm Pat Foran. Coming up on Consumer Alert, if you use social media, you've probably seen ads for clothing, electronics, and other items, but be careful what you buy. There are many fake ads online. You could lose your money or end up with an inferior product. I'll have my reports just ahead. Lots of excitement here at Lamport Stadium as the King and Queen Showcase gets underway for the Toronto Caribbean Carnival. I'm here with Laverne Garcia. You are the executive chair of the Festival Management Committee. Tell us what's happening here tonight. We're so excited to be back. Um, today is the King and Queen competition. So it's the huge, what they call big mass costumes, where they, um, they have spent all the months and weeks decorating these costumes and preparing them for today and then individuals will dance them. They can be up to, you know, 14 feet tall and 10 feet wide and um, they're going to be great. They're in for a real treat tonight. We certainly are and it's so great to have the Toronto Caribbean Carnival back. There's lots more happening, of course, for the rest of the weekend. We'll talk about that coming up. We're going to talk about the weather for tonight. It is a good night to be outside and for the rest of the event tonight, we'll have pretty fair weather. Losing that chance of showers. We do have some gusty winds at this point, but even by the time we get in the next few hours, we're still going to be sitting in the mid-20s. Humidex value in and around 30 and overnight low tonight of 15 so cooling down with some fog later on I'll be back with the rest of your full forecast coming up since the beginning of the pandemic there's been an increase in, in the number of people who say they've lost money purchasing items through social media ads some of the ads you might see on Facebook and Instagram are outright fakes others promise a lot more than they deliver Pat Foran has the story on consumer alert Pat Zoraida and Nathan, online shopping has more than doubled over the past two years, and there are many good deals to be found through trusted retailers. But scammers are also placing fake ads online or selling products of extremely poor quality. Lowe's has a good reputation, competitive prices, and high-quality items. It's why viewers were surprised to see these ads on Facebook. In one, a lawnmower that would usually sell for $500 or more is listed for only $99. In another ad claiming to be with Lowe's is a backyard shed that would normally sell for $800 or more for just $66.99. We contacted Lowe's. They said both ads were fakes. A spokesperson said, unfortunately, these posts are misleading and we systematically flag them to our teams internally in order to block them. There's definitely been an increase uh, since the pandemic, but they've always been around. Facebook told CTV News it tries to remove fraudulent ads and in a statement, its parent company Meta said, we remove content that purposefully deceives, willfully misrepresents or otherwise defrauds or exploits others for money or property. There are some scenarios where customers will find that they've paid money for a product that either never shows up or it shows up and it's very poor quality. That's especially true of clothing, which may appear as a luxury brand in an ad, but arrive looking like a cheap imitation. Not everything you see online is going to look as good when it gets here. Even if social media companies say they're doing what they can to remove fraudulent ads from their website, they often pop back up or on another website, and there are other red flags to watch out for. Beware social media ads selling products that claim to support charity that come with free trial offers that sell counterfeit merchandise and use apps and websites of unknown origin. I just want to make sure that businesses have a clear return policy and a refund policy in place. And if you see a price that seems too good to be true, it probably is. And if you're tempted to buy a product through a social media site, do some research first. Do a Google search of the product and business name with the words complaints, reviews or scams and see what pops up. What you find may help you make your decision. On your side, I'm Pat Foran. If you have a consumer story idea, email us at alert at ctv.ca. Right, this is really the start of the big, long weekend with mm -hmm. Caribbean Carnival. Yeah, and we hope the rain stays away for the outdoor festivities tonight, Michelle. I think they will actually, they will actually, Zoraida and Nathan. We are looking at clearing skies for the most part in the GTA in the next little while. Slight risk of showers, pretty good, but let me tell you, Lamport Stadium is the place to be right now. The sun is shining, uh, the music is hot. People are very excited that the Toronto Caribbean Carnival is back. And I know I'm talking to Mishka Crichton. She is the festival manager. And, you know, we have the King and Queen Showcase tonight. But that's not all that's happening this weekend. Tell us else what else we can expect. Well, outside of there being, like, the city is buzzing and there's a billion things going on. 
Uh, after tonight, we move into our Pan Alive, which is our steel pan showcase on Friday right here at Lamport Stadium. It starts at 7 p.m. And then we move into Saturday, the Grand Parade. Uh, looking forward to seeing about over 10,000 masqueraders in beautiful costumes take the lake shore this weekend. It's, it's such a meaningful thing that the Toronto Caribbean Carnival is back for so many reasons. Um, I think it's just one of the most exciting events that happens in the city. What does it mean to you to be back live and in person? You know, after two years of lockdown and cancelled events, the, the carnival is exactly what the city and what we've all been missing. An opportunity to celebrate each other, to celebrate freedom, diversity and inclusion and, of course, just a time to be together again. It really is. And, and what I really appreciate is just how much work and preparation goes into all these events. I know you know that, but we see all the people that are participating tonight in the King and Queen Showcase that are getting ready right now in behind us. How long does it take to put some of these costumes together? I got to tell you, the Carnival Arts exists all year long. As soon as this carnival is going to be done, I'd say probably by September and October, the bands are already starting to think of their themes for next year, developing costumes. And then, of course, the big work is making these big mask costumes. Well, I can tell you one thing, Mishka. The weather is on your side this weekend. The sun will be shining, and I'm going to tell everybody about their forecast. But thanks so much. I know you've got a lot to do tonight and for this weekend, so we look forward to everything that's happening. Oh, and people can still get tickets, can they not? Absolutely, you can. TorontoCarnival.ca slash tickets. And thank you for the well wishes. Thank you so much, Mishka. Okay, let's talk about your forecast because, yes, the sun is shining. Quite hot and humid right now in the city of Toronto. Uh, weather is, of course, brought to you by Train, the most reliable heating and cooling brand it's hard to stop a train temperatures around the region right now are still in the upper 20s feeling in and around the 30 mark it is 27 degrees right now in the city of toronto feeling like 30. we are going to get a cool down though as we get into the overnight period a low of 15 in toronto that's just a touch below our normal low of 17 for this time of year you can expect fog to develop through the overnight period so do be aware that visibility could be poor on the roads through the overnight period and into the early Early morning tomorrow. We do expect a mix of sun and cloud tomorrow. We will have some sunshine after that fog lifts, but then some increasing cloud and the chance of showers as we get into the day. So we're not quite out of the unsettled weather yet. The air quality will be good tomorrow, though. We're sitting in the low risk range, which is great news around the region. The UV index will be very high, though. So when we do have the sunshine, it will be in full effect and you will need your SPF if you're heading out. So looking at our satellite and radar imagery, we've had some showers down around Hamilton, Niagara, up over towards the Lindsay area, more severe storms in and around the Ottawa region. Looking at how things play out, this front has gone through. We had had that heavier rainfall in the GTA earlier. Slight trough that's uh, going to be affecting us tomorrow with a bit of cloud cover and there is that slight risk of showers. Let's just take a look at how things play out on our forecast radar uh, as we get into the night clearing but we do have that fog pausing tomorrow looking pretty good in the morning but there are showers that could pop up as we get later into the morning into the afternoon they will be isolated in nature and will mostly have some sunshine and clearing after that looking good into friday night and looking good through the long weekend so 27 feeling like 30 tomorrow 28 feeling like 32 for saturday 31 feeling like 34 for sunday and 31 feeling like 35 for Civic Holiday Monday. It's going to be a great weekend. Back inside to you. Thank you, Michelle. St. Lawrence Market is getting ready to expand its hours of operation. Starting July 31st, this Sunday, a one-year pilot will begin at the market. It'll involve opening up on Sundays as well as later morning opening times and later weekday evening closing times. The city says it received feedback from residents who wanted more hours to shop outside of their work schedules. The pilot will now will inform plans for a more permanent expanded schedule. Coming up, the odds were against her, but after almost a year in ICU, a Toronto woman is now back home. A success story made possible by the collaboration of a dedicated care team. After almost a year in ICU and on a ventilator, a Toronto woman is now home with family. It's an amazing step for someone with such a complex case. CTV's health reporter Pauline Chan has the details. She was alert and waving, and if you listen carefully, you could hear the sounds of Drake singing, Hold on, we're going home. The doctors told me uh, she basically wasn't going to make it within 24 hours when she was at Humber. However... 
I've been told that since she was born. 27-year-old Nicole Pampina was born prematurely. My daughter was born with cerebral dysgenesis which means her cortex at birth was damaged. Joseph Pampina, who is blind, is Nicole's main caregiver. Her mother died from cancer some years ago. He communicates with Nicole by holding his hand on her head, and Nicole, who is nonverbal, nods her head for yes and shakes her head for no. On August 20th, 2021, Nicole underwent surgery at Humber River Hospital after suffering from bleeding. She was immediately admitted into intensive care and put on a ventilator. But remarkably, she held her own and slowly improved. 340 days after she entered ICU, she left the hospital. Bye. Registered social worker Olivia Coughlin was with Nicole from the beginning and says this is an extremely rare situation. Typically patients who are on ventilators uh, have to go to a, a secondary program before they're able to go directly home. So this is definitely a first for us, sending home directly from our ICU. Um, and it's a very unique case. The key was having Nicole's private nursing team train with staff from Humber River, as well as West Park Health, to become skilled at using the ventilator and related equipment. Nicole is only home for a day pass, but if everything runs smoothly, she can live at home permanently. A special event today, her first shower in 11 months. I'm not much of a Bible thumper, but I'll tell you, she really is a miracle child. Pauline Chan, CTV News. They are the next generation of star competitors, those who take part in esports, but some are feeling burnt out. Arthritis, eye strain, and anxiety, just some of the impacts being felt by players. CTV's Krista Sharp reports. Big arenas and big stress. Uh, we were trying to solve the problem of choking, which is players don't perform to their expected potential. According to a study published by the University of Waterloo's engineering department, which surveyed mainly eSport coaches, some high-level players are burning out, practicing 12 to 14 hours a day, six days a week. In the world of eSports, these games are updating every few weeks where these changes uh, create ripples that will affect even team compositions. At the end of the day, these athletes don't have the same training that your traditional sporting athletes would, um, and it leads to them not going through the proper warm-up, the proper stretching. The most common physical stressors are related to posture and wrists. You see lots of esports athletes in uh, their late teens or early 20s that are already developing arthritis. And when it comes to mental pressures... Esports players are, unlike traditional sports, they're not used to uh, going in public, playing in front of people. They used to, they practiced in the comfort of the room uh, without any social interaction. And then suddenly you just put them in a stadium where there's tens of thousands of people watching them. It's a huge uh, leap that they need to, to adapt to. The popularity of esports is rising, so much so that the government of Ontario announced this year $1 million over two years in post-secondary scholarships after recognizing the impact on jobs. Across the country, the gaming industry supports 55,000 full-time jobs. And of all the regions, Ontario is home to the most video game companies with nearly 300. A serious game that can come with serious impacts. Make sure that you put your health front and center. Playing the game is great, but you want to be able to play that game until you're old and gray. Krista Sharp, CTV News, Kitchener. Local cinema fans are likely to be spending some time on their computers tonight after a major reveal from the Toronto International Film Festival. We now know the full list of films set to receive gala presentations at TIFF 2022. To be a warrior, you must kill your tears. You're asking me to take them to war. TIFF announced The Woman King, starring Viola Davis, will join the roster of opening night galas. The world premiere of the sequel to Knives Out will also be a special presentation, as will the debuts of new movies from Steven Spielberg and Sam Mendes and several other acclaimed filmmakers. TIFF organizers tell Variety that the plan is a return to the pre-pandemic festival atmosphere after alternative arrangements the last two years. TIFF runs from September 8th through to the 18th. The official trailer is now out for a high-profile movie dramatizing the life of Marilyn Monroe. And How'd you get your start? Maybe. What start? In movies. What? This is the second glimpse we've had at Anna de Armas in her role as Hollywood icon Blonde. It's based on the novel by the same title by Joyce Carol Oates. 
featuring what Netflix calls a boldly imaginative film capturing Monroe's complicated life. Blonde begins streaming in September. Six years after releasing Lemonade, Beyonce's long-awaited next album is out in just a few hours. You won't break my soul. So far, the singer has shared the lead track of her album, Renaissance. She posted a message today ahead of the full drop. Beyonce says Renaissance is one of three albums recorded over three years during the pandemic. She added, creating this album allowed me a place to dream and to find escape during a scary time for the world. It allowed me to feel free and adventurous in a time when little else was moving. Renaissance is out at midnight. Another major event on Toronto's cultural calendar is making its return after a pandemic hiatus. Nuit Blanche hasn't happened in the city since 2019, as public health restrictions led to cancellations of the annual all-night celebration of contemporary art. Today, the date was set for the 2022 edition. It'll take place from sunset on October 1st till sunrise October 2nd. Nuit Blanche will return to the downtown core and Scarborough and expand installations to parts of North York and Etobicoke. More than 150 artists are slated to take part, and you can find the full listing on the city's website. Stars Tonight is brought to you by Lastman's Bad Boy. Who's better? Nobody. Sunny as the fog lifts early tomorrow morning, then increasing cloud and the chance of showers with gusty winds at times. A high of 27, feeling like 30 with the humid X. A recap of your full seven-day forecast is coming up. The government needs to do something. They need to do it now. Updating our top stories, Bowmanville's hospital's intensive care unit is being temporarily relocated because of staffing shortages. As we head into the long weekend, the Ontario Nurses Association says at least 14 facilities have closed beds, whole units or reconfigured care. We want to protect our kids. Vaccination is a great way to do it. Parents and caregivers can now book a COVID-19 vaccine for children six months to five years of age. Appointments can be made through primary care providers, public health units, and pharmacies. What fans see and what they look at will be dramatically different. The Rogers Centre is getting a major makeover to the tune of $300 million. Officials say it'll bring fans closer to the game with new social spaces and viewing areas. Bigger, more comfortable seats will also be added. The work will be done over the next two off-seasons. On the market, the Canadian dollar gained four basis points to $78 U.S. American benchmark oil was down to 96.42 a barrel. And the TSX Composite Index climbed 202 points to close at 19,456. Tech investors are digesting a long list of earnings announcements that came after market close. Amazon reported revenue that topped estimates and the company gave a strong sales forecast for the current quarter. Apple also beat estimates. iPhone and iPad sales fared better than expected. This follows the first of its kind announcement from Meta yesterday. The parent company of Facebook and Instagram saw revenue decline as ad spending drops and as competition intensifies from rival TikTok. A big change is coming to one of the world's most popular soft drinks and how it's bottled. Sprite has been recognized for decades by its green cans and bottles, but Coca-Cola says it's getting rid of the green plastic bottles for more environmentally friendly, clear ones. The company says the green, clear plastic contains chemicals that make it impossible to recycle. Coke says the move will cut down its plastic waste by 20 million pounds compared to 2019. Just ahead, perfect pupils. The Toronto District School Board announces the top five scholars for 2022, all of them graduating with a 100% average. Imagine getting a perfect average in grade 12. For the first time ever, five TDSB students did just that, and they spoke about their achievements at a special ceremony. I think I'm incredibly lucky to be here. I'm sure there's lots of things out of my control that brought me here. Uh, getting 100% average. I did go to a specialized high school program at Etobicoke School of the Arts, and I think it really shaped who I am today in many ways. Uh, in addition, I think it's uh, kind of a passion to learn. I love learning things and uh, trying stuff, new, new things. So I think just uh, being able to throw yourself out there. In the future, maybe like five, ten years from now, I want to be an engineer. As for the type, um, yeah, I'll figure it out in university. 
The students were all named TDSB Top Scholars. They received their awards from Education Minister Stephen Lecce. On behalf of the province, you know, well done. I mean, that requires hard work and discipline and a great sense of confidence. And you have overcome some pretty crazy obstacles. And with those 100% averages, the new scholars have also built up an impressive resume of achievements outside of the classroom, even during the disruptions caused by the pandemic. The minister also congratulated Nina Du, one of the five TDSB scholars who wasn't able to make it to the ceremony, but also kept it 100. Congrats to them. Okay, let's go back to Michelle at Lamport Stadium, the king and queen basking in heat tonight. It is. This is the place to be right now. It's a beautiful evening, losing that chance of showers. It is hot out, though. Let's take a look at our current temperatures in and around the region. Sitting at 27 degrees, feeling like 30 at Pearson downtown. Very close to that. It is hot. It is humid. And looking at through the long weekend, we have a lot of heat and humidity building in for the long weekend and sunshine. So whatever you're doing, whether you're at Toronto Caribbean Carnival or any outdoor activities, make sure that you stay cool and hot. Back to you. All right, thanks, Michelle. Be sure to join us later tonight for CTV News at 1130. In the meantime, you can stay up to date by going to our website and watch breaking news all day long on CP24. For Michelle Jobin and all of us at CTV News, have a good night. We'll see you at 1130.